everybody. Um, welcome to our think tank talk in a bit of an unusual setting this time. Can you hear me? Good, perfect. So I'm very happy to see so many faces and so many familiar faces, and I'm actually really looking forward. This is the first think tank talk this, that we are doing as a Zoom call. So I'm looking forward to how this is uh, going to work out. We want to keep our usual setting of breakouts and interaction. So at one point you will be sent out in a breakout room talking to a, a fewer people and giving you the opportunity to exchange um, more in depth um, with other participants on the topic. So for those who don't know me, um, I'm Maria Isabel Wieser. I'm the deputy director of Forhaus and the head of the Think Tank, ta uh, Think Tank Hub. And um, Moritz, um, he will talk a bit more about Forhaus, but I will give you a brief introduction about what the Think Tank Hub is. Um, so the Think Tank Hub is a um, platform that wants to enable think tanks to, uh, to give think tanks a platform so they, ca they can share their expertise with the ecosystem of International Geneva. And we are very happy actually to have with us uh, today, we have Il Isabelle Hilali. Um, Moritz will say more about her, but she is uh, our think tank representative. And then we have lots of other people from other backgrounds, from very interesting academic and practitioner backgrounds. So it's a really interesting panel that we have today. Um, so a quick heads up, the session will be recorded. So everything that the speakers are saying as from now is recorded and will be available online as well. Um, the breaks out, breakout sessions won't be recorded. So everything that you say there keeps, stays in the breakout room. Um, we will do a quick wrap up. So the speakers will then have a quick wrap up of what, what was discussed in the breakout rooms. Um, and the end will be recorded again. So just so you know, feel free to express yourself to say what you're thinking during the breakouts. Um, without further ado, let me introduce you Moritz Figert. Um, he works at Forhaus and is a fellow. Um, and he will say a bit more about himself and introduce the speakers. So enjoy, have fun, and don't forget to ask, uh, to interact and to ask all the questions that you have. And I'm very much looking forward. Thank you, Maria, and, and, and welcome everybody again from my side. Um, I feel free also to, to share your, your, your camera. I mean, I, now I'm just seeing names, but it's also cool if you see some faces here. And I hope you all brought your, your lunch. I have my banana. When I have some time, I will also try to eat something. Um, so a quick word about Foros, maybe, for those who don't know us yet. We are Think Tank, uh, Forum on Foreign Policy. We, we see ourselves as a, as a forum that gathers uh, stakeholders from all, uh, all areas and backgrounds um, around several foreign policy related topics. Uh, and, we, and we recently, so at the beginning of the year, we, uh, we started to work on the topic of digital health. Um, uh, where we have a project on uh, on uh, health data governance, which we uh, we have in the we, we are running with our partner Sensor Advice, and, and we started to explore the question of digital uh, digitalization in healthcare, and 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 more more specifically uh, around the, the question related to health data, because without health data, without uh, common uh, guidelines or rules on health data uh, processing, collection, etc. Um, it's actually pretty difficult to use the, the, to leverage the full potential of uh, of these digital, new digital technologies and AI, AI driven technologies that we we have uh, have in in healthcare now, and and this is also why we said, well, let's do a think tank talk together with with the think tank hub because it's uh, it's a really timely, uh, well, it's it's really timely now with the the COVID nineteen crisis you see more and more that the digital health and AI driven technologies can help us actually uh, to solve uh, well, uh, to solve um, global health challenges such as the COVID-19 crisis. And, and, but there's, we see that there's a lot of opportunities, but then we also realize, oh, there's so many challenges. You, know, you need, you need a, a discussion, a debate, a public debate around this topic. And, and this is what we do with our project, but this is what we also want to do today. So, the idea is really to discuss uh, which good practices exist in epidemiology, but also in other healthcare areas uh, related to uh, digitalization of healthcare and, and, and digital uh, technologies. 
uh, but also what kind of framework conditions would we need? So from an ethical perspective, but from a technical perspective in general, what kind of policies are needed in the field? And this is why we're really happy to, to have uh, speakers from all backgrounds with us who work in different areas internationally, uh, be it in, in the US, uh, be it in Africa, be it in, uh, in Europe as well, and who have been working, uh, who are practically working as well. So, so this is, um, yeah, this is, uh, we're really excited about it. Maybe before we, I present the speakers, I, I would quickly run you through the agenda. So what we have planned today is that we first have some keynote speeches about uh, from, from practitioners and from people who, who have been working on, on different projects related to digital health and AI in, in healthcare in the current crisis as well. And, um, and then we break out in, in, room, in, in four rooms with each speaker leading, um, leading, leading one of the, the discussions. And, um, and there you really have, to, we want you to be able to interact with, with the, the speakers and, and have also an active role in this so that you don't just uh, listen, you know. Um, and, um, and then we would come, so this would be about 20 minutes and then we come back to the plenary session uh, and uh, we do a wrap up and have some time for Q&A if there's still open questions you would like to ask to the speakers or, or to the Foghouse team. Um, yes, so this is a bit about the agenda. So now I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker, Akash uh, Venkatasu Brahmanian, who is project manager at the uh, IDA, which is the International Digital Health and Artificial Intelligence Research Collaborative. He is also a data policy manager for the digital transformation at the UHC 2030 coalition. Um, and he has a, a background in biomedical engineering as well. He, he worked in different um, areas around health policy, te technology, innovation, and social justice across Asia, the Americas, and Europe, and, and has been working also in different international organizations such as UNAIDS and the Global Fund. And, and he will now share a bit about uh, the work that IDE has been doing uh, in, in the field of digital epidemiology and, and also talk a bit about uh, existing challenges that, that, he, that they have faced and they have seen. Akash, the floor is yours. Thank you, Moritz. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Um, uh, thanks to everyone uh, who is on the call. Uh, like Moritz said, IDARE uh, is a follow-up of the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation, uh, which was in 2019. The, the former executive director of the, of the panel is now leading IDARE. Uh, IDARE seeks to be a neutral and trusted platform uh, for enabling research collaborations in digital health and for convening multi-sector stakeholders to problem solve for, uh, for on digital health and AI for health. Um, this is in line with WHO's UHC 2030 targets, UHC 2023 targets, uh, where they say uh, uh, we want 1 billion additional people with essential health services by 2023 and 1 billion additional people with universal health coverage by 2030 as part of the triple billion goals. Uh, Digital technology, we are in the midst of the technology revolution, as some people want to call it, the data revolution. Uh, and digital health can uh, go a far way in, in reaching these uh, targets of the UHC. Um, just to put the context, half the world today does not have access to essential health services. Uh, WHO estimates there is a global shortage of 18 million health workers worldwide. Most of them actually in parts of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, which are under-resourced in different ways. Um, there are several challenges, whether it's from a technology perspective, ethical perspective, legal and political perspectives. I'll get into them in two minutes. Uh, there is a lack of trained human resource in many different parts of the world um, that digital health can address. Uh, public trust is another problem. Uh, uh, people are, communities around the world are losing trust in, in communities, in, in policymakers, um, in governments, in institutions. Um, there is not enough gender equal, gender equity in, in global health. Uh, there is not enough youth engagement. Uh, health systems continue to be siloed, continue to be reactive, and they should be proactive, predictive, preventive, um, and patient-centric. Uh, digital technologies can go, can, can help changing some of these things. Um, and COVID-19 in this sense is actually giving us an example of what we can change in a way. Uh, I'm just sharing my screen uh, quickly. 
uh, on the screen is, uh, is a quick typology of the kind of digital enablers that we can have uh, during COVID-19, whether it's with risk management of public education apps that some countries have developed, uh, infodemic management falls into this, telemedicine uh, uh, and drones for, uh, for different uh, purposes are being used in different countries in Europe, in Africa, Asia. There is contact tracing, digital contact tracing and tra tracking apps. Uh, there are digital tools for vaccines, for therapeutics, um, or the, these could be collaboration platforms. You know, DigiZade is available for genomic sequencing data. There is Kaggle for, for the data collection. Um, apart from this, there are several digital tools for remote triage and testing, whether it's uh, to, to have qualitative indicators like cough audio based tools, uh, quantitative indicators, natural language processing, etc. And finally, there are several models around the world. There are several localized models, some global models uh, that predict this epidemic spread, that predict and transmission uh, dynamics. Um, staying on this, uh, I'm sorry, I shared the wrong screen earlier. Uh, staying on this, um, these uh, models uh, can uh, are not always diverse enough. Uh, they are not always uh, culturally sensitive. They don't always take into account uh, socioeconomic inequalities. Um, and there is, uh, there are, they are competent on their own and the policy decisions are very competent as well. But we have seen during COVID-19 that there is a gap in communication between these two. Algorithms don't always talk to policymakers. They don't always have this direct connection with them. Um, uh, and uh, this, this could be due to several reasons. One being uh, quite a cliched term, lack of co collaboration between different disciplines, whether it's a technology, policy, or in the exploration part, as you can see, you know, with biologists, with epidemiologists, social scientists, we need more collaboration to have uh, more, more robust solutions. Um, and probably most importantly, uh, these models often look at predicting epidemic spread and transmission dynamics when in fact they could they would be better off predicting the system the burden on health systems that they have whether it's with beds uh, whether it's with ventilators whether it's with data itself um, we can use digital technologies we can use ai in certain situations to combine these knowledge across disciplines to have better collaboration between policymakers and technologists um, in this sense if we really want good collaboration, it is not possible without ensuring inclusion and equity uh, on different levels, whether it's with geographic inclusion and equity, whether it's with, with gender, with age, uh, and sectoral equity. So for instance, uh, there are several challenges for international collaborations today, uh, but challenges are often opportunities uh, as digital technologies has taught us over the last couple of years. Um, some of these challenges are, are on the resources. There are strategic and specific challenges. So when you look at strategic, they, they may be resources, uh, whether it's funding, whether it's data, data test beds to evaluate the data, a human resource. Um, we can solve some of these um, concerns through digital health, through data, through good use of data. Uh, there are operational concerns. Uh, there are different sectors. It's a very uh, chaotic sector is digital health. There are governments, there are private sector, international organizations like WHO and UN system, uh, uh, research and academia, civil society is often active in advocacy. Um, so all of them need to work in a mutually beneficial, mutual platform, in a trusted platform, uh, which will be a challenge. Um, on the specific level, uh, there are several technological challenges. One example is, is on COVID-19 with digital contact tracing. Uh, there are several if conditions. As technologists, we are conditioned in a way to believe accuracy is the gold standard. But during emergencies, perfection is often the enemy of good. And reliability is probably more important than accuracy, uh, whether it's with data collection, data organization, with, with digital tools. So one, one example is, uh, is the digital contact tracing tools uh, through Bluetooth signal data often pick up Bluetooth signals when two Bluetooth, two phones are within 1.5 meters of each other, if they are within each other for 15 minutes at least, if the phones are on, if, uh, if it's interoperable data systems that we are looking at. So there are lots of if conditions. Um, this is from a COVID-19 perspective, but the, often these are valid, uh, valid concerns beyond emergencies. 
probably most importantly, there are ethical challenges, whether we look at uh, privacy and ownership of health data, you know, who owns this data, but is, is it the people who contribute the data, which is ideally the case. Um, uh, is it the governments? Is it the, the institutions that develop models, which is which shouldn't be the case? If we really want global health uh, health data as a global public good, uh, these are concerns we need to address: privacy, data ownership of data, safety and security of where the data is stored. You know, how long is it stored? Uh, when will it be stored? Until uh, when the emergency lifts? You know, do, do people get released from this uh, data from contributing the data? Um, what what happens beyond emergency situations? There are several uh, answers we need. Uh, from the legal perspective, again, uh, WHO is best positioned to have a global health governance framework, uh, as evidenced by the international health regulations uh, during times of pandemics, during times of public health emergencies of international concern. There is no legal regulation globally today for health data regulation. Uh, this may be a concern as global collaborations increase, um, this should be something that we look at. And uh, WHO again often says, the Director General often says, health is a political choice. UHC is a political choice. Digital technologies to, to reach UHC will eventually be again a political choice at the most. Um, we need to address these choices. We need to have strong arguments to advocate for good use of beneficial use, inclusive use of digital technologies of health data. And at the base of all of this is trust. Um, it's the ultimate benchmark. You know, Moritz earlier mentioned that we, we don't have always common benchmarks. Uh, we look at good practices around the world, uh, situational best practices. Uh, trust is the ultimate benchmark. Trust is the ultimate benchmark for good collaboration. Uh, we should be trusting in with other sectors, but more importantly, we should be trustworthy. Uh, uh, whether we are, whether it's the public sector, the private sector, the international organizations, civil society, um, building trust will be crucial to good international collaborations. Uh, and I'll stop there for the time being. Thanks a lot, Akash. Uh, really, really interesting uh, inputs from you and also from your work that you have been doing with IDEA. Um, well, a lot has been said, I think, I think uh, what you really uh, mentioned about, about healthcare being a chaotic sector, uh, where you have many actors who have their own uh, institutional way of working and, and and, and, um, and, and where we see that we need a governance framework, we need common rules and guidelines to sort of build up this trust that you mentioned as well. Uh, I think this is a really important point also for us at Poros uh, with, with our project. Uh, and maybe uh, also the, this 18 million health workers shortage that you mentioned, I think that's also a huge uh, challenge worldwide and, and especially in low and middle income countries. And this leads me to our second speaker, Christoph Su, because Christoph uh, is a practicing dermatologist. Um, he uh, he uh, also is a member of editorial boards of the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology and the Journal of the European Academy of Dermatology. And aside, he's also a medical consultant in teledermatology and AI at the Basel University Hospital. And, and more importantly for us now is, is he also started an incredible journey with uh, the project called Cashion where he really works on, on this uh, on questions around teledermatology and, and how to make uh, health services in dermatology more accessible worldwide. And I'm really happy that he, that uh, Christoph, you could find some time to join us. Um, I mean, you're, you're practicing and, and we don't want to hold you back for too long, but uh, it's really great that you, you're here and can share some, some insights from, uh, from the practical perspective. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Moritz, for, for introducing me. So uh, my presentation is going to be more uh, based on slides, so I'm already going to share the screen. Can you see it now? No. Wait. How do I choose? Can you yeah. see it now? Yeah. So I'll just open the... Um, Well, I'll, I'll ju I, I'm just going to do. I'm just going to try and do the full screen. Can you see it now? We see it. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to be presenting on my project uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa for recognition of uh, common skin disease using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So, uh, I'll be dividing the presentation into the following parts. 
First, I'll be talking about uh, dermatology in Africa and the WHO compatible solutions that we would have. I'll introduce shortly artificial intelligence and then how I'm going to combine it with the passion project which we're doing in Africa. And then I'll finish the presentation with an invitation for anyone who's interested to collaborate. So uh, first I'm just going to mention dermatology in Africa. So uh, skin disease are like everywhere else, they're common and uh, they occupy uh, at least nine out of 10 children uh, on the whole. The, the density of dermatologists is, is on the other hand very low uh, with uh, one for a few million in countries like Tanzania. But we have a good network coverage, so 95% uh, of the of a network coverage in Tanzania and uh, a high s a smartphone uh, usage. So uh, we decided to focus on five skin disease, which I'll mention later, uh, because uh, they occupy 80% of uh, the skin disease on the ground. So uh, first, uh, how can we... Uh, um, be compatible with WHO objectives. So uh, we just focus on SDG3 for the good health and well-being, and uh, the universal health uh, coverage as well as sustainable development goal 10 to reduce inequalities. So how can uh, machine learning actually work uh, to, uh, uh, to s find solutions? So, uh, we thought it would be a project which would be on three continents. So we have two places in, in Africa, one in uh, Tanzania and the other in Madagascar. And we have a collaboration on the AI technical point of view in Basel and in Changsha in China. So how does a machine learning, uh, for, I'm, I, I wasn't sure about the audience, so I'm just gonna simplify. So how does machine learning work? So it's basically two things uh, to find a solution using AI. We need uh, on one hand, plenty of data. So the data can be existing or it has to be created, uh, augmented and also labeled. That means we need to, uh, for a learning process to happen, we need to, um, uh, we need uh, dermatologists who find their time to actually uh, put a name on the diagnosis on, based on the images. And then we need an algorithm. So this algorithm uh, needs to be trained uh, based on the data and uh, based on the results that we already have. So that's supervised learning. So ideally, uh, with this, we will obtain a candidate model, which can then be deployed into an app. But I'll explain the project. It's not that simple. So uh, how do we, uh, what technique are we using? So we're using uh, artificial neural networks, more specifically convolutional neural networks. So basically on the left, you see an input layer uh, where you receive images, and these are twitched to reach the output layer on the right. It's basically making a prediction and adapting the prediction based on uh, the adaptation of weights, uh, depending on the answer that we want to have con uh, versus the answer that uh, we obtain uh, before the learning process takes place. So uh, why do we use uh, 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 machine learning on Chinese and Caucasian populations that don't African skin? That's a bit of a bummer. I understand the question might be a bit strange. And uh, uh, the, the answer is data. So we have very little uh, uh, data available in Chinese and uh, Caucasian skin. And of course, the ideals can be to collect it on uh, African skin, but um, in the meantime, we have to use techniques to actually augment the data to uh, feed the algorithm. So, uh, so one technique we're going to be using, not relying on, but uh, using, is called generative adversarial networks. So this is um, a tool where you can actually uh, work on different um, images from from uh, patients who don't exist and actually with the labeling on the you have on for example the Caucasian and the Chinese data sets you can be able to create models uh, on black skin and adapting the morphology and based because you have the labeling you're going to be able to do supervised learning so uh, this is an example not related to our project but you can actually see on the left uh, three uh, features uh, of three people who actually exist and uh, transform them to a picture on the right, which doesn't exist. So imagine actually uh, taking uh, some, some images of, of Chinese and Caucasian people on, on the left and uh, getting some African, um, African skin on the right. So technically this works, 
uh, by mixing up uh, real images uh, taken on the ground uh, and actually mixing it up with the uh, uh, generated images and forcing a discriminator to actually accept the images being correct. So what else do we need for that project? So we need uh, experience. So uh, uh, it's good to learn from scratch, but uh, it's time-wise is not very practical. So uh, we're going to be creating models, as I said, on Caucasian and Chinese skin, and we're going to be using what we call transfer parameters to actually start the algorithm, not from scratch. So it's a bit like you want to identify a car and you're able to identify a truck. And basically you want to, uh, you want to lose, use that experience to, uh, to learn new things. But in the end, what we need is more data. So uh, the idea is we, we, we're collaborating with centers uh, on the ground to collect the data to anonymize it and to work on it. And then we also have uh, pictures in possession, some from our databases, of course, being in white skin, but also uh, the, uh, the collaborative centers also have pictures. They're less well uh, informed, so uh, they're not an ideal way of learning, but they, 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 they have the advantage, for example, to being labeled on very basic, on very basic scale and, and be mixed with the unlabeled data. So uh, why did we choose the disease? So again, uh, these uh, conditions make 80% of, of the problems uh, on the ground. They are amenable to management strategies locally. That means uh, these are not uh, diseases which cause death, but they definitely um, cause great morbidity. And I think if we can recognize them, we can actually help the patients as well as the carers and the community overall. So um, I'm just going to finish by uh, explaining the project. So uh, it's going to be on uh, over three years and we have a two parts. We have a technical part and a clinical part. So the clinical part is actually uh, creating models uh, where you are, we're going to validating the accuracy of the models. And these will be mixed uh, progressively with some data which is collected by dermatologists, medical officers, and healthcare providers on, gen, 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 on a limited IP area. And if we get uh, an accurate model, we can actually uh, then, uh, uh, you can imagine someone sending a picture, getting a, an, an assessment from the machine, and, uh, and, and then um, uh, being able to deploy. But that's a research, it doesn't want to say we work, but we're very hopeful it, uh, we'll do our best. Uh, uh, so I would just like to uh, do two more slides just to thank everyone knowing that uh, I can't mention everyone, but I, I, I probably did mention uh, most people in our teams. And uh, I'm just going to uh, finish up by uh, uh, opening collaboration possibilities. So we need, to, uh, we need to gather images from dermatologists, but we also need to work on the data, find algorithms, and also um, uh, find uh, practical ways to actually uh, uh, safeguard the way of submitting data because submitting data is, is, is a precious thing and um, uh, it's very useful. We can actually even imagine if we are very accurate to do some epidemiological studies for these five skin conditions uh, on, based on geographical areas, scaling up the number of diseases we can do and as well as the phototypes. So uh, I'm, open, uh, I'm, I'm open to collaborations and you can contact me uh, with this email address. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christoph. Uh, also for, for sharing a bit more the, the hands-on practical side of, of how actually these uh, algorithms and, and technologies work and how and having this really concrete example of, of the passion project is, is, is great, I think, also for our discussion and, and, and our event today. Um, I think we all heard that you need more data, so feel free to reach out to Christoph. And also, if, you have, uh, yeah, if you're willing to collaborate, we have something to bring to the project, I think you would be more than happy to to receive your, your, your email. Um, this spring, I mean, Christoph talked a bit about, about challenges also working in low and middle income countries. And now I would like to move to our next speaker, Megan Diamond, who's working um, as an assistant director for programs and innovation at the Harvard Global Health Institute, where she leads uh, portfolios or uh, projects on artificial intelligence and global health, migration and health and global health system and works uh, with different stakeholders and in different uh, geographic areas to explore how technologies can uh, 
be a transformative force for improving health, uh, health globally. Um, Megan, you have the floor. Great, thank you uh, so much for that introduction and for the opportunity uh, to be part of this, this panel and this discussion. Um, I'm delighted uh, to be here. And so what I'm gonna do today um, is really talk about uh, the role of AI in the COVID response with particular focus on low and middle income countries. And a lot of this work that, I, that I'm gonna talk about today and the thinking really comes out of um, the Harvard Global Health Institute uh, initiative called uh, Data Science in AI Summits for Healthcare, or affectionately called DASH, which is a series of regional summits where we bring together folks um, across discipline sectors in, in geographies who are thinking about uh, the role of AI in healthcare um, and really breaking down silos and encouraging collaboration, um, which seems to be a common theme um, that's supported from the other panelists here today. Um, what I'm gonna do for these seven minutes is really give a high level overview of the hype versus the reality of these AI tools. And what I do wanna emphasize is that these discussions um, about the promise and peril of AI um, are surely not new. Uh, it's an ongoing conversation. As you heard um, in the first uh, panel from Akarsh, we've been thinking about these issues prior to COVID and what COVID has done is kind of highlighted many of them, magnified these issues um, and created new ones and also created new opportunities. Um, as we heard earlier, the impact of COVID-19 disproportionately affects people in low and middle income countries. Many of the health systems in low and middle income countries um, are already weak at baseline. They don't have enough healthcare providers to, to tend to the needs of the population or the, the diagnostic capacity for other diseases. Um, and the, the preparation for pandemics um, was minimal and continues um, to be quite limited in some of these contexts. And so what this means is that there's a huge need on the ground. Um, and what we've seen is tech has played an incredibly important role already in addressing that need. Telemedicine has exploded, uh, SMS has become an essential tool in getting messages out to populations around the world. And we've seen numerous platforms um, that have allowed for real-time reporting um, of, of cases and deaths um, available on the internet in real time. And what this has allowed for is the rapid dissemination of information um, to, to people who are in rural villages or urban centers about symptoms to be aware of or where they can seek care. Um, it's opened up access to people who can now get it uh, uh, virtually on the internet and has allowed uh, to protect healthcare providers and allow them to do some of their job uh, from home. And it gets uh, the, with the data in the hands of policy makers and researchers quickly and so they can use it for action. Um, and AI has been a key part of the discussion about the role of technology in the COVID-19 response. It's been uh, talked about in terms of risk assessment in, in patient prioritization, screening and diagnosis, logistical planning and economic interventions, supporting drug discovery and treatment, and the list goes on and on about the areas for which AI could be applied. And we've seen some of this um, manifest into tangible tools. Um, I'm sure everyone here has heard about the chatbots uh, that are coming out of CDC, the US CDC, and the WHO, amongst other um, industry organizations. There's been tools being tested that automate diagnosis of COVID-19 through the use of chest x-rays or CTs, or tools that mine the internet and social media for misinformation, or to predict uh, impending hotspots of COVID-19. And so as I outlined before, um, the needs on the ground in low and middle income countries were already there before COVID-19, uh, as were the challenges in addressing them. And so as we, as we think about using AI um, in the context of COVID-19, we really need to, to be mindful of all the information and thinking that's been put into identifying challenges and opportunities. And we really need to, to think about how COVID-19 makes those challenges and opportunities different or specific to the disease. 
And so just a few examples of this um, are, are about data volume in, in data labeling, right? And so we, we've heard that in order to train an algorithm, you need a lot of data, right? It takes a lot of data. And COVID-19 is, a, his, is a, a new pandemic. We don't have historical data. So we're starting from baseline, like we're starting from scratch in terms of collecting that data, which is an, a challenge in itself labeling the data takes a really long time and it takes expertise and in the context of a pandemic you don't have the time and the expertise that normally would be part of that process has competing priorities another component uh, of ai tools is that they need to be maintained as the system um, evolves so i think this is really easy to think about in the context uh, of a chatbot that's potentially triaging, triaging patients um, to get care um, if they're displaying symptoms of COVID-19. But what's unique about COVID-19 is that in real time, we are learning about how the symptoms present. And every month there's new guidelines coming out about what could be a symptom of COVID-19. And this is really different than a lot of other diseases uh, for which we're, we're using chatbots and other AI tools for which we already know what their typical presentation is and what their, their course looks like. And so it's super important that we're maintaining these systems because if not, then there's the potential that uh, you're missing cases or you're not triaging people um, that need to seek care. And, and there's a lot of negative implications for that. Another huge point of discussion always when it comes to AI tools is bias in, in exacerbating racial in uh, income disparities through the use of these tools. And I think a, a really strong example of this is in the US, we see that African American people um, who visited hospitals with COVID-19 symptoms in February and March were less likely to get tested and treated than white patients. We also saw that at, in some places, testing was only available in drive-through settings for people who had cars and could afford cars. And so this is the data uh, that then gets fed in, into the system for which an algorithm is trained. And the algorithm doesn't have a moral code, right? It just learns based on what it's given. And so as the old saying uh, for epidemiology goes in data science, if you have garbage in, you have garbage out. Um, and in the midst of a pandemic where things are moving super quickly, this is of particular concern. One more thing uh, that I wanna emphasize is that we always need to be mindful that uh, AI solutions and every solution uh, related to health is not one size fits all. And something that works in one context may not translate at all to another context. And I think a really interesting example of this um, relates to, to all the fantastic innovations that have been coming out that use uh, mobile phone data for social distancing um, and other in mobility data uh, for other types of interventions. Um, in many parts of the world, it's quite common to have multiple cell phones. It's common to have your cell phone charge at a, um, a charging station that's in another town or to share your cell phone. And so what does that mean in terms of modeling? How is that accounted for? And what is the narrative that the mobility data is telling us in those contexts versus other contexts when, when people just have one cell phone? Um, so it's really important um, as people are moving quickly to develop solutions to address this urgent need in low and middle income countries, that they're mindful of this, this, this inability oftentimes to translate um, innovations from one context to another. And so I think, uh, you know, AI has a ton of potential and it always has. And so what we need to do is be incredibly realistic about what it can and cannot do in the current moment and, and what it is better to, suited to do um, in a future moment. And so just a few key takeaways to remember that AI is one item in the toolbox. There's a lot of other uh, impactful digital solutions such as SMS and telemedicine that have been leveraged that are, that are having huge impacts on populations. And there's a lot of non-digital solutions um, that are super important that we need to invest in, hand washing, um, just basic behavioral interventions that can be incredibly impactful. Uh, we need to encourage transparency in reporting. There's been many studies published um, that have lacked careful description of model specifications, which make it hard to reproduce and kind of uh, puts a fog over the underlying mechanisms for the model. 
we need data that um, is open access and we need it uh, to be collated in one place so that we can kind of edge towards that data volume problem that I talked about before. And we need to encourage innovation from the ground up. Uh, people from their own communities know best what the health needs are and the types of solutions that they need. And so we really need to, to be mindful to invest um, in people on the ground from local communities and be mindful of history and uh, in other situations where people in low and middle income countries have been used um, as first round guinea pigs for vaccines and drug discovery. And I think there's been a lot of really important and helpful conversations already about that, how that's not the approach to take um, with COVID-19, but we also need to carry that conversation over to talking about AI, right? We don't wanna use uh, populations in low resource settings as a testing ground for, for new AI solutions. So we need to always be carrying an ethical framework in all of the work that we do, technology or not. Um, I wanna echo Akarsh's uh, point about the need for multidisciplinary partnerships. We need to rely on experts from around the world. Uh, you know, this is, um, a lot of people have talked about these issues already and thinking deeply about um, the opportunities and challenges for AI. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel um, for a lot of these conversations. We just need to access the people that already know about them. And so I just wanna to close with this thought that we're, as, as we move forward in the pandemic, we're always gonna see this balance or always strive for this balance rather for the urgency uh, to meet the demand and the need for evidence-based solutions. And I don't know the answer to that and how we find that balance. And hopefully we can talk about that um, in the breakout session. But what I do know is that we need um, to keep our eye on the ultimate prize. And the ultimate prize um, is improving health outcomes for populations around the world as we go through this unprecedented health crisis. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, I think there was a lot of content and a lot of good points you made about, uh, about uh, existing issues and opportunities. Um, well, first, I also wanted to thank you because you woke up really early. I mean, you're based in Boston, basically. So uh, thanks again for, 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 for joining us for this call. Uh, and maybe some, some points, uh, you talked about uh, the need for inclusiveness in, in the way we train algorithms uh, so that there's no discrimination. And, and also uh, an important point I think in the current crisis is that there is no, there's no magic solutions. We have many solutions which should be combined. And this we also see with the whole debate about contact tracing, uh, these contact tracing apps, you don't, um, this, not, this is not gonna solve the, the whole question, but maybe it's one of the solutions that we can, we, we, we can use, but we need also the safeguards and we shouldn't move too fast just because there's urgency. Otherwise we might even do more damage than, 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 we, than we have. Than, than that uh, what we have uh, uh, at the moment as well. And, and now I would like to move to our last speaker. And, and you said, uh, Megan, you said um, this topic is not new. And actually, uh, Isabel Hilali has been working on, on, on uh, the, the question of digital health and AI driven solutions for healthcare since, since uh, quite some time already. Uh, just a brief introduction. Um, so, Isabel is the CEO and the founder of DataCraft Paris, which is a platform for data scientists which uh, seeks at enabling uh, collaborations amongst data scientists and companies. And, um, and she also founded, founded the Health Data Institute, which, which is a think tank that brings together different actors and experts in the field of AI for, for, for health. And um, she is a member of several advisory boards, such as the Health Data Hub. So, Isabel is going to share now some, some of her experience in, in different projects where, where, um, where digital health and AI-driven solutions could help uh, in the current crisis and, and beyond. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Well, do you see my screen? Because for, oh, okay, perfect. For some reason, I, I couldn't see it very well. Um, so, hi, everybody. Um, so, um, well, indeed, I, I'm the founder and CEO of Datacraft, which is a, a club for data scientists and data engineers where um, we are meeting, sharing good practice and accelerating each other projects. Um, so we, we've been working on a lot of initiatives and I, I wanted to share a few of them. Um, so maybe to start with, um, I'd like to talk about the Healthcare Data Institute. So I, I'm sorry, I forgot to say, but I'm based in Paris. So um, some of the initiatives are international, but 
but basically we we are working on 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 the with the French ecosystem. Um, so the first initiative is from the Healthcare Data Institute, um, which is a, a think and do tank, which is gathering um, people from healthcare and big data industry. It started uh, five years ago, and basically we realized at the time that big data was the big world. Like now we are all talking about artificial intelligence and few of us really um, knew how it could be applied to healthcare. And, and we decided to create um, a think tank gathering people so that we could all, all learn together and maybe develop more projects. Um, so just, just to tell you more about who is in, it's basically it's um, public and private organizations um, from startups to big companies and the entire ecosystem. So it, it's gathering the public institutions um, together with companies like Big Pharma, <laughs> sorry, <coughs> Big Pharma, MedTech, um, hospital, um, also patient associations, and, and a lot of people from, from the tech industry. And for once, we, we are all going in, in, in one direction. And, and that's, um, that's a discussion I had with the organizers. It, it, in my view, it's a new way to, um, I think lobbying is, is really not the right way because, but it's a, it's a new way to make things change from inside while working together. So it has proven to be <laughs> very efficient. And um, so right now, what the Healthcare Data Institute is doing is um, to help its members, we are gathering all the initiatives that are going on so that um, everybody can join whatever is key to them. And we, we are trying to, <coughs> to track all the initiatives. We are trying to identify the good sources of data because as several of, of the past speakers said, really one of the issues is um, when it comes to artificial intelligence to get access to data. Um, we are involved, for example, trying to support teleconsultation, which is really booming in France at least. Uh, but it's, if, <laughs> if you don't have data, it's really tough to analyze um, what's the impact of teleconsultation. If a big thing, for example, is um, late diagnostic for anything that is non-COVID related, and trying to see um, what teleconsultation is, is helping and trying to get a picture of what is not being detected at the moment to anticipate um, the end of the lockdown. That's really important, but it's really tough to get the data. So that's something we, we are working together as a group. Um, so that's for the Healthcare Data, <coughs> data Institute. And then <coughs> I wanted to emphasize about um, what COVID is showing us in regards to data science. Of course, uh, I like what Megan said, um, data is just a very, very small piece of um, the tools that, that we have to, um, to, to bring solutions to the crisis and to support the people. But when, when talking about that tool, what we see is that um, digital is, is, is really growing. Um, not just in healthcare, but in everything, whether it's, uh, it's food distribution, um, anything else. And it's, it's very true for education is the same, but it's very true for healthcare. And <coughs> what we see is if we really want to do the right thing, be efficient and be sustainable, uh, we need to be creative when it comes to data. Uh, we really need to, to um, interact with with other activities. Um, I, I, can, I can give you an example, which is one of the reasons I, I started Datacraft. Um, if you work in healthcare, one of the big points for you is to understand how people will take their medication, especially when they have a chronic disease, because it's, you know, after a while, it, you really just want to give up and think that's okay, I don't need it. I'm not even sure it, it's something I really need to take regularly. So you can work on, on modeling, trying to develop um, applications to support people to take that treatment. Um, 
but it's very interesting if you meet people who work on, uh, for example, um, on a big sport, on the big soccer club, trying to anticipate who amongst their uh, player is going to leave the club. Or if you work with a mobile operator trying to anticipate again, who is going to leave them and, and switch to another mobile operator. Um, it, it's the same kind of mechanism. You just use different data and you just see it from a different angle, but working together really makes a difference. And what we see is with that crisis is that we, we need to leverage data and we, we need more collaboration. Um, so two initiatives that we are working, one is, is called, and I, I put the link on purpose, it's called the Epilogue um, Collaborative Platform. It's one of uh, <coughs> our members who started it. It's, um, well, the idea was to try to gather as many um, good sources and, and also validated sources of information because we see there is so much fake news. <coughs> And um, the, the CapCode who started that, they are specialized in analyzing the social um, network data for healthcare. So they gather a lot of data, they saw all the fake news, and, and you have that platform that anybody, it's open, it's open access. So anybody can use it to, um, to get access to data and develop its own, its own tools. You can also contribute to it and add data into it. Um, another thing that we did is, we went to see uh, nursing homes for seniors, which are very, very, I mean, they are in the center of the crisis. And we offered to help them on, on a pro bono basis. And it's very interesting because we, we started with very small things because they don't have that many data. So initially it was, maybe we will help you with your logistics. And then they started saying, oh, that's, that's interesting. Can you also help us with the, the way the nurses are working in, inside the um, nursing homes, which we started doing with them. And then from that, we moved into like a very, uh, very much more sophisticated tools to, <laughs> for them to pilot their, <laughs> their activities. So that's a way to see how starting from a little thing um, data is, is really getting much more uh, into healthcare. And then maybe the last, um, the last thing I wanted to share with you is, is another collective that, um, that we started. Um, in France, a lot of people from the um, um, data and consulting um, ecosystem decided to team up to support um, and develop solutions for whoever needed them. So it, it has, it started small and now it's pretty big. We are like over 1000 uh, participants. Uh, so data scientists, <laughs> data engineers, people who develop, um, who are hosting data, who, who develop applications. And we offer the French institution support. So uh, a lot for healthcare, but also education, economy. So if I can give you a few examples, um, economy, we are, we are trying to um, develop tools to help um, the institutions de decide where they should, um, which small and medium sized company they should help and how, what is the best uh, use, use of, the, of the money that can be distributed on education. <laughs> We are working with um, nonprofit organizations that are that are supporting um, kids that um, are learning from home and don't have the chance to be helped by their parents. So we are working with them to help them collect data when they are mentoring kids. So we start from the basics: how do you get your own data sets, and then um, how do you collect them to be able to develop tools and, for example, monitor. Um, when mentoring is more efficient or less efficient, so to give back to give back feedback to mentors. Um, so lots of projects are going on, and and we think really the idea was to bring solutions. Um, but my my last slide is on um, well, what are the conditions for that? So we see on one hand we have digital growing a lot of initiatives. Um, a lot of data scientists really eager to help. Um, and at the same time, um, 
well, also healthcare are very interested in, in, in seeing what can be done. Uh, what is great is that I think I don't remember who said that, but but we see a, a lot of um, digital initiatives um, really starting uh, during the crisis. Um, we also see more concrete benefits. I think before it was everybody wanted to be digital and get transformed, but no one really knew what it meant. And for once, um, people are really from the healthcare industry are really starting touching. Okay, oh yeah, that it can do that. That's very interesting. Um, and before we break into the small sessions, um, what I wanted to say is that's great. Uh, let's not forget about ethics because initially you had two worlds. You had the data science that was just crazy about data and really wanting to move very quick and very fast and <laughs> very conservative healthcare world um, that was really um, wanted to do things very slowly in a very conservative matter just to make sure that people data would be protected. And now everything is in a urgent mode. Uh, in France, we have a big debate, for example, about the stop COVID application, uh, which is using mobile devices to, to track um, people movement and be able to share data on, on people that might have been cont contaminated, who, who else they will see. We have huge debates about that. Uh, probably it won't happen the way it was initially meant. Um, so I think it would be great to talk amongst ourselves how do we not forget about ethics while we still are able to, to move fast. Thank you, Isabel. I think that's a good uh, transition to the next, um, the next phase of this, uh, of this event. Um, Christoph, uh, because he's a, pract a, practice, a practitioner, he actually has now some patients coming in, so he needs to leave at one, but I will take over one of the rooms. Um, but thanks a lot, Christoph, for, for joining us. Now we will be split in, in, four, in four different breakout rooms and discuss in more depth uh, all together and then come back in about uh, 15 to 20 minutes um, to the plenary, plenary session. Um, I think we have some five minutes left for quick, where quick reporting back from, from the breakouts and, and maybe then also some last, uh, last questions you would ask to the to speakers. So I don't know um, in Akash's room, if, uh, if somebody, Akash or somebody from the room wants to report back what has been discussed some key learnings? Yes, uh, I will start, but uh, Reno, uh, Kohei, uh, Charles, Isabel, please feel free to add, you know, I may miss a lot of points. Um, one thing that we thought was very important from a political framework, you know, the framework conditions that we need from political ethical places, uh, considerations is we need to start locally, uh, similar to what Megan had said earlier, uh, the local context is extremely important. Uh, global governance is effective, but uh, not uh, ineffective without taking different local communities' uh, participation, uh, being participatory, being inclusive. Uh, uh, this is a big concern. Uh, so the local context and the local context changes in different uh, regions and different cultures. Um, so that, that is an added aspect. Another uh, learning that we had, um, is on, on the purpose of the data that we share. Uh, uh, what is it shared for and what is the access to data? Uh, so the three M's, uh, missing data, misuse of data, and missed use of data. So a lot of data is missing uh, from uh, talking about just the COVID-19 perspective, but also other emergencies. Um, uh, we need to have good access to missing data. We need to, not, we need to ensure there is no misuse of it. Uh, that people are not disrespected, that, uh, that there is the trust that stays, um, and uh, that, that it's not missed. Several, a lot of data is, is useful, but not always used. Uh, so we need to have, we need to make sure that's not missed. Uh, our last point uh, in the was, a question, was an open question by one of our uh, participants. He asked, what is reliable data? Uh, I think that's a great question for, for a lot of people to answer, you know, and, and since we're starting out with digital technology, what is really reliable data and when is it reliable? Uh, who is it reliable? Who, who uses it? Um, so when we want to share, what is reliable? Thank you. 
somebody else from the group wants to say something or, or, or did he do a really great job in summarizing everything? And I'm not sure how many, so Megan, you were in another room or you wanna? Yeah. Yes, I'm gonna pass it over uh, to Matthew um, mm -hmm. for the summary. Sure. Hi everyone. Um, we, we talked about two main points um, just in general. Firstly, um, we, we talked about the concept that AI itself is a dual use technology. So it has both peaceful and military uses. Um, and I think it, it's unlike most health technology, um, it can easily move to a point um, where it's used for non-peaceful purposes. Um, and I'm think, thinking um, of things along the lines of um, uh, an AI system that's good at categorizing particular types of skin could also be used at a population basis to segregate people or follow a particular type of person. And we know that this type of technology has been deploying in, in many, in, is being deployed in many jurisdictions across the world. So I think we don't, while we don't want to um, put a dampener on the, the use of AI, I think it has many powerful um, applications in both individual and population health. Um, I think it's important to always remember that ethical aspect and to ensure that we have a plan and a process for dealing it, with it. Um, the other thing we talked about was that one of the other issues brought up was around um, data, the, the, the problem that, um, well, the key issue is that uh, there was a lack of data and in in my um, in my experience and I, I work in in government in um, for the Department of Health in in Victoria in Melbourne uh, Australia in my experience um, we have a key issue in that there's no semantic interoperability between lots of different sets of data so when you're looking at things at a population level um, it's very difficult to make generalizations or to usefully use this whole data together. And I think this is probably a broad problem worldwide. I don't, I don't expect we're the only <laughs> people to encounter this issue. Uh, I know that depending upon the healthcare system in Australia is different to the US, is different to France, is different to Switzerland. Um, it comes with different perspectives, but certainly our key issue in Victoria is about um, sharing data between organisations. And we have a, a large problem that we're looking to address. And the problem really is not technological. Uh, I have a both a um, IT background and I'm at the end of a Master of Public Health. So I have an IT and a public health background. And IT people will see that the technology is being what needs working on. And sure, you can spend a few years putting complicated technologies together, but the problem really is generally in terms of policy and governance and governments and the public. The, the problem is generally not with the technology itself. Um, I think no. that was our summary, Megan. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. I think that's a great summary. And just one thing I, I wanted to add on to that point is, you know, you, you, Matthew's describing these challenges uh, in Victoria and reflecting them in the context uh, of Switzerland. And so if we think about challenges of interoperability in these contexts, then we pivot our mind to thinking about low resource settings where there are many don't have um, an existing EHR at baseline. And so these challenges are definitely not unique to low and middle income country, but they're surely um, exasperated. And so it's something to consider when we are thinking about new technologies that do require a solid foundation of data. And then the other thing I would just add is um, we did touch upon this idea of gathering lessons learned and the reflection on that this is not um, our first infectious disease outbreak. Surely it's been a while since we've had a pandemic, but there are a lot of key takeaways that we can learn um, from other outbreaks. I'm thinking a lot about um, Ebola in West Africa, um, and instead of using uh, COVID to gather lessons learned and then reflect on them after, being mindful of the lessons that we have already learned um, and applying those um, in this context now. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, I mean, um, we, uh, I, yeah, we also talked about, about this, this learning from this crisis and not to come back here to this stage again and, and really 
that we, we, we say, okay, we, we went through the COVID-19 crisis, but at least we, it helped us to learn and, and, and uh, react in a more efficient and faster way. And um, maybe from our side, we also talked a lot about ethical uh, gu guidelines and at the global level, how do you assess different cultural uh, sort of uh, cultural um, understanding of what is ethical or not? You know, this is maybe a big, a big uh, thing to consider when you talk about WHO guidelines and, and uh, house data regulations. Um, and more generally that uh, we should go beyond just looking uh, at state level, we should look at all actors because uh, we cannot just rely on states to, to help us um, sort, of, well, uh, sort of solve uh, global health issues and, and sort of use uh, technologies, uh, AI driven health technologies in an in a, in a efficient way. And um, yeah, and yeah, exactly. So this is a bit of some key, key takeaways from our side as well. Uh, maybe Isabel, you want to quickly say something about your your group? Yes, we well, we decided to really focus on the mechanism of um, data exchange and how to to share data. Uh, it was great. We had a very international group, um, so we had a lot of different perspectives. Um, what we said is that basically, um, yeah, we were lacking mechanism to get access in, in, a, in a secure and, and sustainable way to, to data. Um, I shared what we do in France with the, what the um, health data hub is. The health data hub is the public um, database of, of healthcare data and they serve as a third party. So if you are less mature organization, and you want to give access to your data to data scientists, you can do it through the health data platform, which is, makes you feel a lot more secured. And, and also then if you want to um, cross your, data, your own data with public health data, that is made easier. So I think it's a very interesting initiative. Um, we talked about um, what is happening in India, where uh, we were lucky to have a, um, uh, Anthony from India, who shared um, what is being done and, and really the development of, uh, of the data culture, also sharing more data, including sharing with, with journalism, uh, which I think is, is great in terms of transparency and, and education. Um, and Kathleen uh, shared a lot of very interesting resources, so I, I, I see she, she's put them on the on the conversation. <laughs> so for anybody else who, who wants to get access to the data, um, it's there. Right, thank you. Well, I think, Maria, do you want to wrap it up? Yes, so thank you very much, Moritz, for uh, doing the moderation. Thank you so much to all of you, Megan, Isabel, Arkash, um, Christopher had to leave, but for, for your contributions. Um, I want to say uh, it was a really interesting experience for me. It was the first that we did like this, but I, I had a very great time. It was very interesting. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I was actually, while I was wrapping up, I was thinking about how we could deal, since we don't have uh, like um, the carte de visite, like uh, business cards. Um, so if you want to me to share your contact with the group of people that were here, please send me and shoot me an email. I can put it here. This is actually my email. You can see it in the conversation. Shoot me a quick email. Um, we will do a follow-up mail to all the participants that have been here. If you haven't registered through Eventbrite, shoot me your email here in the text that I can uh, add you on the distribution list. Um, one last point, we have another think tank, we have another, no, not a think tank talk, but another event tomorrow on um, gender, uh, on the gender perspective of the issue actually, um, and it's gender and data, the unlearned lessons of a global pandemic. So if you're interested in a more gender specific lens, uh, please join tomorrow, it's at, it starts at two. Um, and but it will be webinar style, so less interactive. You can just click in and get out if you need to leave. Um, it was a pleasure meeting you guys. One Stay last thing from my side. Sorry, which, one last thing. If you're interested in the events that we do at the Think Tank Hub, you can also shoot me a quick email. 
and register for this. And I let the last word to, to Moritz. <laughs> yes, actually, I, f I forgot to make some, some promotion for our platform Policy Kitchen, where we actually have a discussion group on COVID-19. And we discuss data related issues, but also uh, issues with regards to foreign affairs, more generally multilateralism. What, what is this crisis bringing, uh, bringing us as, as lessons learned, but what, what also, what, what do we see as phenomena, et cetera? And, and uh, we have a discussion forum for it. So if you're interested in keeping up the discussion there, there you can join as well. It's policykitchen.com. Perfect. So you can see actually everything on the, on the right. If you open the conversation, you can see people sharing their email addresses. I, but I will include them in the follow-up email. You have the link to the Policy Kitchen. Yes, the webinar tomorrow will be recorded. I see the, the comment there. So uh, we will also uh, make it available online if you want to follow up on that. Um, any questions, you can raise your hand and I can actually see it. I'm just going through, but you need to have your camera on if you have questions, otherwise I don't see you. <laughs> yes, uh, Charles, I see you are putting your hands up. No, Charles Blass. Yeah, I, well, actually, you read my mind. I didn't, but I, I did. I did want to um, drop that that big question again uh, for anyone. If there's a quick answer, what is reliable data? I'd really like to know, and I think a lot of people, other people would too. Thanks. So, if someone has the answer, you can also send me the answer. I will also send it in a follow-up email. Um, but otherwise, please get in touch with our experts. They have been sharing their addresses, I think, so you can keep up the conversation. It was a great pleasure having you all here. Thank you so much for joining and stay in touch and see you soon, I hope again, and have a lovely afternoon or morning and day for Megan, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.